You're about to watch a St. James Sermon. Thanks for joining us. We're currently preaching our way through the Book of Romans. Martin Luther once said that the letter to the Romans is truly the most important piece of the New Testament. And the more one reads it, the more precious it becomes. Well, we hope that's your experience too, as we journey through this wonderful book together. Thanks for watching. About once a month, we try to always feature uh, a mission spot uh, because obviously St. James is not just busy here, but by supporting, encouraging, um, financing Christian work well beyond our walls, uh, we seek to see the great gospel of Jesus go out beyond this place into our neighbourhood, our city, our country, and indeed the world beyond. But we don't want to ever trick ourselves into thinking that mission is just about going overseas. It certainly is that, but it's also happening right here on our own doorstep. So this week we caught up with Yonick uh, as he uh, shows us a little of how our kids' church here at St. James is constantly on mission. So uh, we caught up with him. It's up on the screen. Hello, everyone. My name is Yonick, and I am on mission right here at St. James. Now, if you're thinking the way that I used to, then that probably sounds strange because I used to think that being on mission and being a missionary meant leaving your homeland and taking the gospel with you. And you won't be wrong thinking that way. But Jesus' message in Mark chapter 16 to go into all the world and take the gospel to all of creation doesn't only mean far off countries or remote groups of people. Come with me and I'll show you. Hey, Tumi! Hey, Yannick! Welcome to Children's Centre! Ah, thank you. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too. Ladies and gentlemen, for decades, thousands of children have been coming to this building. <laughs> and Tumi, you've been coming here since you were four. That's right. Can you tell us why? Well, Yannick, to be honest, there were many reasons. I was a hyper little kid, so the fun and games kept me well occupied. And you got to meet tons of people and be part of God's community. They also didn't give you any homework, which was a huge selling point for me. And most importantly, you got to learn about God, His great love for us, and ultimately how He showed that at the cross. Oh, that's fantastic and all great reasons, but you are not a kid anymore. So <laughs> why are you still here? Well, Yannick, I can still be on a mission, even if it's right here at my home church. I got to learn the message in a way that I could understand when I was younger, and I get to make that a reality for the kids that still come through our doors. So it's a great place to be on a mission. And how awesome isn't it that we can take the gospel and package it in a way that kids will understand, but yet it stays truthful and relevant, not just for them, but also for us. Mm. <laughs> I've got to get back, but before I go to me, one question, you are a Christian. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came to be? Well, Yannick, after hearing the word here in the Children's Center for a number of years, I finally decided to take action and give my life over to Jesus. I wanted to be part of his kingdom and I've been trusting in him ever since. Oh, to me, may God continue to bless you and may you continue to grow in him. Mm. Also, may the seeds that you plant here at St. James grow and bear fruit for the kingdom one day too. <laughs> Thanks, brother. I appreciate that. I've also got to go do some work on my jump shot. So good to see you. Good luck. Can you edit that out, please? Now, I joined St. James as a young adult in 2011. And by that time, Tumi was almost an adult, so I never got to teach him. But I have the great privilege of serving alongside him. I believe I was called and sent to be on mission here at St. James to teach young people about Jesus and the great God that we serve. But the kids' ministry mission field is not one of instant gratification. Sometimes you have to wait years to see the seed that you sow bear fruit. So is it even worth it? My name is Shannon Brooks. I'm Jeremy. My name is Sid. My name is Tim. I'm Eden. My name is Gemma and Yannick was my leader from when I was in grade 4 all the way to when I was in grade 6. Yannick led me when I was in grade 6 or 7. Yannick was my leader in grade 6. Yannick was my leader when I was in grade 7. I have been part of St. James Kids Ministry since I was a kid. And today, I'm a follower of Jesus 
who shares the gospel as they get a four to six boys lead. I was fortunate enough to grow up attending St. James's Kids Ministry as a young girl, and now as an adult, I'm actually a grade eight girl leader for Leighton and his youth team. Today, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I spread his gospel through the youth and the music ministries. Today, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I help share the gospel by serving in the church and youth band and helping out on Sunday mornings in the kids' center. Today, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I help share the gospel at J-Zone on a Friday. Today, I'm a follower of Jesus, and to help spread the gospel, I serve in the grades one to three ministry on a Sunday morning. If the kids I get to share the gospel with in the mission field right next door hear about Jesus, become saved, and want to share that salvation with others too, then I definitely think it's worth it. Here at St. James, we do many things to reach children with the Bible's message about Jesus. From kids camps, to kids clubs, to holiday clubs and children's church, it's all for their salvation and the glory of God. But before I go, I'd like to thank you for your continued generosity to gospel work here at St. James. Your giving allows us to share the gospel with kids in new, fun and creative ways. So can I urge you to keep partnering with us in this way. Also, will you be praying for the kids and the leaders and the ministry, myself included? And lastly, if you love Jesus and you've been thinking about how you can serve him physically, Tumi and myself will be around after the service. Let's chat. I just want to bring you up to speed with uh, a few bits of family news. Uh, just remember, men in the room, uh, August 31st is the Cape Town Men's Convention. Uh, posters are in the foyer, information's out there. Uh, booking is through Quicket, so please make sure you get your ticket. Be a man and be there. Uh, we look forward to seeing us all back in the room for that. Um, if you are in or interested in uh, the Bikers with Bibles uh, group that go out for a ride, uh, it's pretty cold and wet today, not a lot of fun on the back of a bike, so they are moving that to the 18th of August. Uh, so if you suddenly find yourself riding all by yourself this morning, that's why, uh, come back and join them on the 18th. And then lastly, uh, all four parents, uh, grandparents, guardians, all those who love and care for little kids, uh, we've got the next pod club coming up this Friday. So make sure that you check your emails. If you're not connected with Jenny in the children's department, they'll send you the link of a podcast to listen to, and then you come through on Friday while the kids are busy and uh, the parents discuss it to uh, encourage one another and help our kids together. Well, with all that in mind, I'm going to ask the stewards to take up the collection. When we give, by the way, it's actually an expression of faith. We give in faith that the money that we, uh, that we generously give uh, will make a real difference in the lives of those for whom it is intended as the gospel goes out. And as you saw through Yonick's clip, uh, there's a lot of that going on right now. So give generously and make sure you greet those you are with. We'll be back together in just a moment. Good morning, St. James. It's wonderful to be here with you today. My name is Natalie, and I'll be doing the reading for you this morning. I'm reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. God's everlasting love. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. 
So some sad family news. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who know uh, the Connolly family well, um, we had the very sad news that Wendy uh, passed away very suddenly on Friday evening. Um, she and Clint were away for the weekend. She has been struggling <clears throat> with hypertension, high blood pressure, um, but of course it's a terrible shock for them, for the family. And so if I could just ask you to continue to keep them in your prayers. Um, they've been part and parcel of our church family for a long time, have served here. It's an awful shock for all of us, but of course nothing for us compared to the loss that Clint and Shay and the family have suffered. So please just keep them in your prayers very much. I'm going to pray now as we come to God's word. Please join me. Father, we don't understand the things that happen, the challenges we face, the tragedies that come across our path. We thank you for today's passage, which speaks so much into that reality. And as we pray for the Connollys, we pray for others um, who carry great burdens and sadnesses. And we ask that today your word will meet us at our point of need. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday morning, um, our focus was on what we called Paul's clear perspective. A perspective which enabled him, and I hope us as well, to see present sufferings in the light both of future glory and also in the light of God's good purpose. If you missed last week, can I encourage you to catch up and listen to it on our YouTube channel, not because of the preacher, but because of the text. It's a great, great truth that we looked at last week. And I trust if you were here, it was a great encouragement and help to you, as indeed it was to me as I was preparing. So that was last week, that was Paul's clear perspective. Today, as we finish Romans chapter 8, and as we finish the second part of this great letter, we'll come back to it again at some later stage, but for the moment we're going to step away from Romans for uh, Daniel, as Scott said. But as we finish chapter 8, as we finish the second part of Romans, we move from Paul's clear perspective to Paul's deep conviction. A conviction that empowered him to face those present sufferings in the light of what we've called God's steadfast love. So what is this deep conviction that Paul held and that it is my prayer that I and you will hold today and not just today but in the weeks and the months and even in the years ahead? Well, you'll see it there in the last two verses that were read for us. The last two verses of Romans 8. Now, I think we've got those verses, Joy, have we, on the screen? There it is. So, I am keen for us to hear and see this great conviction. So, please read it with me. Um, I trust you can see it clearly enough. We try to put it all on one slide. Say it with me, will you? For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, what a conviction that is, dear friends. Absolutely nothing, says Paul, can separate us, that is, can separate Christians from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Do you think that Paul was sincere in holding that conviction? As you read those words, which we'll leave there just for the moment, do they have the ring of sincerity about them? Yep. Yes. Yes. Does the fact that Paul was sincere about that conviction mean that we should share it? Mm -hmm. 
Does the fact that Paul was sincere about that conviction mean that we should share it? Well, possibly. Possibly. Just because people hold, thanks, you can take it down, Joe. Just because things are held sincerely, does that mean that we should share those convictions? Have you never met people who were sincerely wrong? Have you yourself never been sincerely wrong? What is it that the guy said? I was wrong once. <laughs> not the thing to say in Women's Month. Absolutely not. <laughs> By the way, I did um, send to our staff, let me say again, to all of our congregation, uh, having just celebrated Women's Day, to the women and the girl children in our congregation, we love, we respect you, we are grateful for you. We hope that the weekend has been a good one for you. And please be assured of our respect and our love. I said it last week, I say it again. Without the women of South Africa, this would be a very, very different and a much poorer country. Well, Paul is convinced. I am sure, he says. I am convinced, he says. The question is, should you be? Are you? Do you share this conviction? Now the truth is, dear friends, actually we don't necessarily need to share or should share the convictions of somebody else just because that person is sincere, right? We know that. Something else has to be true for us to share the conviction. And it seems to me that, as I've thought about it this week, there are two things about the conviction that must be true. One, the conviction must be authentic. It must be real. It must be true to life. Sorry to disturb the little person. <laughs> the conviction must be real. There's no point holding convictions that don't work in reality. There's no point holding convictions that are just theoretical, hypothetical. Armchair convictions don't help anybody, do they? So the convictions we hold, at least about important things, they need to be true and real to life. Otherwise, what's the point of believing them? But by the same token, those convictions don't only need to be real and true to life, but they actually need to be true. Now, I know we live in a world in which truth is a, is a, a loose term. Uh, Francis Schaeffer in the 60s and 70s had to coin the phrase, true truth in order to try and convince people of the importance of objective truth. I know we live in a world where is it true is not so important, at least for certain generations in our world. It's not the way we've been raised, some of us. Some of us, of course, have been raised in that view of objective truth. But for many people today, the, the concept of objective truth is something, well, well, I don't actually believe that that's true, which is kind of weird, right? Uh, there's a bit of a contradiction in that. I do not think it's true that there is truth. I mean, that, that's an absolute statement in a world that says we shouldn't make absolute statements. But in reality, deep down inside, we know that if we're going to believe something, we want it to be true. It's no point believing make-believe, but not just true, real. So what I want us to do today as we look at this passage before we come to the Lord's table is to ask ourselves the question about Paul's conviction. Is it real and is it true? What was the Lord of the Ring things? Is it secret? Is it safe? Well, here it is. Is it real and is it true? Does it work? Is it actually true? So I want us to start by looking at the authenticity of Paul's conviction, not its sincerity. I'm sure he was sincere but the authenticity of it, the reality of it. So let me ask you this question. In what circumstances did Paul declare this conviction that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ? Was it in the context of an easy life? He uses the phrase, does he not, in verse 37, we are more than conquerors. Now I remember seeing on someone's cricket boots in a test match, the verse, I think from Philippians, where is it? 
that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you remember that, that great verse? What a great verse that is. Someone had written them on the cricket boots. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is like, this is like a slogan for the Olympics, right? Right? The only problem is that having I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, the next five overs went for something like 65 runs. And I was beginning to think to myself, maybe they should put some whitewash on those cricket boots. So is, is you know, more than conquerors. I mean, that's one of those fridge magnets, right? Those bumper verses. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I can see that on a bumper sticker, right? But what does that actually mean? Does more than conquerors through him who loved us means mean that life should be easy, simple, always good, never any problems, sudden death, terrible loss like the Connollys have just experienced, that that should be a foreign thing to our experience? Is that Paul's world? Well, quite the opposite. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, Paul asks the question that he answers in verse 38 and 39. Verse 35, what is the question? What or who can separate us from the love of God? The answer, nothing can separate us from the love of God. But between the question and the answer, we get Paul's description of real experience. And please look at it with me. What about tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? That's quite a list, isn't it? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. It's such a shocking list that I actually took a double take when I looked at it this past week and thought, Paul, are you exaggerating? I mean, it seems like an exaggerated list, doesn't it? I think if we looked at this list, we would have to say, well, I'm not sure that we experience all of that. As you can see, I've never experienced famine. I'm on the John the Baptist diet, by the way. You know, you've heard of the Daniel diet? Do you know the John the Baptist diet? He must increase and I must decrease. So I looked at this list and I thought, well, that, that seems like an exaggerated list. Then I looked at 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, but we haven't got time to look at it now. Can I encourage you to go and have a look at Paul's letter to the Corinthians? 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11 and chapter 12. You know what you discover there? In 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, you will discover that every one of the words that Paul uses here were true to his own experience. He experienced famine, he experienced nakedness, he experienced danger, he experienced tribulation, he experienced distress, he experienced persecution, and he was in the end put to death by the sword. So is his conviction an armchair theological conviction? When Paul says, I know that nothing will separate me from the love of God, is he talking in theoretical armchair terms? Not at all. It's a conviction that proved to be real and true in the face of harsh reality. Dear friends, I think if we knew in our own experience what Paul actually went through, we would be aghast. So Paul's conviction is born in the reality of Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Things that he actually experienced. Puts our sufferings into context, doesn't it? But look at verse 36. When you see an Old Testament verse quoted in the New Testament, the key thing to do is to go back and look at the Old Testament passage in its own context. So let's take a moment just to do that. <clears throat> Come with me to the text, the verse that Paul is quoting. He's quoting from a psalm, Psalm 44. Turn back there with me, please, or find it on your device, whatever you happen to be using for your Bible. 
Psalm 44. Now, our verse is, our quote comes from verse 22 of Psalm 44. Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And this sounds really as if Paul is talking about himself and his fellow apostles. Because as Paul, so they. They went through a really hard time spreading the gospel through the Roman Empire. But when you look at Psalm 44, you discover that this is not just a verse or a psalm that applies purely to the leaders of God's people or to those like Paul who were apostles or missionaries. We've already heard about mission this morning. Mission far away, which we support and are happy to do so. Mission right on our doorstep, which is just as important. Psalm 44 verse 22 is not just a minister or a missionary or an apostle's verse. Because if you look more carefully, you will see verse 1 of Psalm 44, O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you have performed in the days. So who's speaking in the psalm? Well, this is the voice of all believers, right? Old Testament believers here, but remember, Paul quoting the psalm shows us that this psalm is as relevant for us today as it was for them then. Now, this is quite a psalm. In fact, so much so that I'm going to read it for you, and I'm going to read it, I hope, with some dramatic effect, so that it can land for you and not just be words that wash over you. I'll try and contextualize it for you. Will that work? I hope so. Let me try. O oh God, we've heard with our ears and our fathers have told us what deeds you've performed in their days, in the days of old. Here he is, or when we. You know, when we were young, when we this. Things are always better then, right? In the past, the good old days. Hmm. Not sure the good old days in our country were the good old days. Even though I sometimes hear people talking about the good old days. I know that service delivery, etc., etc., can be a real frustration. But really? Do we really want to go back to those days? I think not. Well, yeah, we are. We heard about this. Your hand, he's talking about the great exodus of Israel out of Egypt. Verse 2, your hand drove out the nations and brought them. But you, them you planted, the nation of Israel. Historic Israel, of course. You afflicted the peoples, but you set them free under Moses. Remember the great liberation that God brought, God brought for his people? Not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. This is positive stuff, right? Yep. We've heard of the revivals of the past, Lord. We've heard of St. James Church and how you did the most amazing things. And the, God did amazing things here. Extraordinary things. I mean, we lived through, some of us who are old enough, lived through a time here at St. James when God moved in revival power unlike anything we'd ever seen before or after. It was an extraordinary time. Verse 4, You are my king, O God. Ordain salvation for Jacob. You remember that language of more than conquerors in Romans 8? Look at this in Psalm 44. Through you we push down our foes. That sounds like more than conquerors, doesn't it? Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. That sounds like more than conquerors. Say it with me. More than conquerors. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from your foes and have put to shame those who hate us. We more than conquerors. In God we have boasted continuously, and we will give thanks to your name forever. We're more than conquerors. And then what? But you have rejected us and disgraced us. Hang on a second, I thought we were more than conquerors. You've not gone out with our armies. Hang on, I thought we were more than conquerors. You've made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten spoiled. Hang on, I thought we were more than conquerors. You've made us like sheep for the slaughter. You, notice, you have scattered us among the nations. He's talking about the exile. You have sold your people for a trifle and demanded no high price for us. You've made us the taunt of our neighbors. I thought we were more than conquerors, but our neighbors think we're nuts, right? 
The people at your work think you're completely bonkers to be a follower of Jesus and to read your Bible and believe it. There must be something wrong with you. I'm sure there must be something wrong with us. The derision and scorn of those around us. You're a Christian? Are you out of your mind? What is wrong with you? Haven't you got a brain? You've made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. My friends at school, my friends at university, they laugh at me for being a Christian. Is this ringing true for you? But you're more than a conqueror. Really? All day long my disgrace is before me. Shame has covered my face at the sound of the taunt of the reviler, at the sight of the enemy of the avenger. Somebody says, oh yes, but of course this is only true for those who don't follow God. You see, if you don't follow God, then this is what's going to happen to you. Really? Well, have a look at verse 17, if that's the wrong theology you happen to hold in your head at this moment. None of you, of course, but you will have heard this often enough. If things are going bad, what's the problem? You don't have enough faith. But more faith and we'll see miracles. We'll be more than conquerors. If only we have faith. Really? Verse 17. All of this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you. We've done nothing wrong. This is the voice of Job, isn't it? I've been faithful to the Lord, but I'm not so sure the Lord is being faithful to me. We have not been false to your covenant. Our hearts have not turned back. Our steps have not departed from your ways. Yet you, God, have broken us in the place of jackals and have covered us with the shadow of death. We haven't forgotten your name or spread out our hands to a foreign God. You would have found out if that were the case. You know the secrets of our heart. Yet you kill us all day long. And we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. How's the psalm landing for you now? Don't you love the last bit? When are you going to wake up, God? When last have you spoken to God like that, dear friend? Awake! Wake up! Get up, God! Why are you rejecting us forever? Why are you hiding your face? Why have you forgotten our affliction and oppression? 1955, the march to the Union buildings. Why have you forgotten our affliction and oppression? When will you wake up, God? When will you do something about the injustice and the oppression in our country? When will you wake up? In your own personal life. Lord, when will you wake up? When will you see my problems? When will you see my challenges? See, the, are you feeling uncomfortable right now? This is uncomfortable language, right? Right? Sometimes people complain to me about God. My stock answer to that, and let me re recommend this to you. If people complain to you about God, please tell them to go and tell him to his face. Well, I mean, don't talk to me about God. Go talk to God about God. Why complain to me? Yes, your God, your God. Why is the world your God? No, no, you go tell him. Because that's what the psalmist is doing, right? Don't you love the fact that the psalm tells us that when we're grumpy with God, the place to go is to God and to tell Him just how cranky we are? There's no irreverence or disrespect here. Rise up, come to our hope, redeem us for the sake of your what? Steadfast love. So when Paul says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, he's not talking in a hypothetical, idealistic, triumphalistic vacuum, dear friends. When Paul says to you and me, nothing can separate us, you, me, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, he is talking in the midst of real life where we sometimes feel that God is asleep or he doesn't care. And he doesn't love us. Because if he did, why would this be happening? Real enough for you? In that space, 
in the space where our life experience challenges everything we know about God in our heads. In that space, Paul says, let me tell you something. There is nothing in heaven or on earth or under the earth or in all creation, no matter what you can think of, absolutely nothing that will separate you from the love of God in Christ. You say, Paul, you've got to prove this to me. I want to believe it. I should believe it. But right now, in my own experience, I absolutely cannot believe it. I'm sorry. I want to, but I can't. Paul says, okay, I'll prove it to you. You know how you can prove it to you? Because day in and day out, he had to prove it to himself. Day in and day out, in the face of persecution, hardship, nakedness, famine, danger, sword, Paul had to keep preaching the gospel to himself. So let him preach the gospel to you. You ready for it? Here's the truth of the conviction. Question in verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? is the last of a string of questions. Did you see that as Natalie was reading for us? Let me frame those questions for you without Paul's implied answers. They're in verse 31 to 34. I'll frame them for you without Paul's answers. Yeah, they are. Who can stand against us? The answer is lots of people. Will God always give us all good things? Well, I'm not sure. Sorry, am I being a bit irreverent this morning? Who can bring a charge? Answer is actually everybody. When people remind me of something I've done wrong and say, well, you know, Mervyn, you're this, I say, you don't know the half of it. I'm far worse than you think. Not to be trite, but it's true, right? Who can bring a charge against us? Well, lots of people can. Who is to condemn? Well, join the queue. And of course, worst of all, who's your greatest condemner? Your own heart. Your own heart. So just left like that, boldly hanging in the sky, these are terrible questions. But notice how Paul reframes them. You see how he does it? Who can stand against you if God is for you? Well, that changes everything, doesn't it? If God is for you, then no matter what stands against you, in the end, you win. In the end, you win. <laughs> I know winning feels lousy sometimes. feels more like losing. But in the end, if God is for you, then nothing will stand against you, if you're a Christian. Will God give you all good things? Well, He may not give you everything you want, but it will absolutely give you everything you need. How do you know that? Well, look at what Paul says. God, we know, will give us all good things because, why? Verse 32, he didn't spare his own son, but gave him for us all. If he gave his son for you, do you not think he'll, along with him, all give you every good thing you need? Of course he will. Who will bring a charge? Well, Who's the one who justifies us? You know, when people bring a charge against you, what do you find? You have to try and justify yourself, right? But who's the one who justifies here? Look at it for yourself. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. So what charge is going to stand against you, dear friend? Are you a sinner? Of course you are. Have you messed up? Yes, you have. So have I. It's why we said confession this morning. But in terms of the great judgment seat of God, God views you in the righteousness of Christ, not your own. And therefore, no one can bring a charge because God has justified you. This is the gospel, right? Because of Christ, God now treats you as if you are perfect. Did you actually hear the words I've just said? I can't believe you heard them and just said they chup still. I mean, it is astonishing. 
I have sinned in this way, and that notwithstanding, I am justified in the sight of God because I'm clothed in the righteousness of His Son. What an extraordinary gospel. Not good advice. Who needs good advice? Good news. That's what we need. Who will condemn you? Christ died for you. He rose again. What is more, He's interceding at the right hand of God for you. What's Paul's proof? What is Paul proving? Let me tell you what he's not proving. He's not proving that your love will never separate from God. He's not proving that, is he? He's not proving that you and I will love God every day. Because I don't and you don't. And we may as well be honest about it. I mean, we can say we love him every day, but if you love me, you will. Keep my commandments. So how's that working out for us? If you love me, says Jesus, you'll do what I say. How's that working out for you, dear friend? Do you love God every day? The answer is absolutely not. Imagine if Paul set out to prove that nothing will separate our love from God. What chance would he have? Zero. But thank God that's not what he's setting out to prove. What is he setting out to prove to you and me? That nothing will separate us from God's love in Christ. See, that makes all the difference, doesn't it? God has justified you. God has dealt with your sin. God has given his son for you. God has raised his son from the dead. Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for you. Even today, even in the midst of your challenges, If we love our children no matter what, do you not think God can do that in a far greater and more perfect way? So are you convinced? In the real world, that nothing on earth, under the earth, above the earth, past, present, future, Backwards, forwards, down, up, sideways, spiritual powers, demons, angel, not even you yourself can separate you from God's love in Christ if you are a Christian. Amen? Come on. You know? Yeah, we need to learn from our charismatic brothers and sisters, right? We really do. What a great thing. Now, here's the problem. If you're not a Christian, you're a stranger to this. You're a stranger. Stranger to it. But you don't have to stay a stranger. This is the love you've been looking for all your life. This is the love you've been looking for all your life. And it's right in front of you. Hammered into the ground 2,000 years ago on a cross. And a free gift for anyone who asks. So as we come to the Lord's table now, celebrate His love if you are a Christian. But if you're not yet a Christian, dear friend, this meal is the moment for you to say to God, I want that love. I want that love. And you know what? You'll come here doubting. And you'll leave knowing that you are loved. What a great thing that is.